Hello and welcome to Response and Health. My name is Bridget Granke and today I'll be speaking with Allison and Chris, a couple whose lives have been impacted by the severity of Allison's endometriosis symptoms. After five years of not feeling right and changing her plans, Allison is here today to talk to us about what brought her to seek a diagnosis, how her life has changed for the better since treatment, and the importance of sharing your story. Alongside Allison, Chris is here today to share his advice on how you can be a better partner and advocate to someone suffering from endometriosis. Keep watching to hear their stories. Welcome Allison and Chris. Thank you, Bridget. So let's start with how your story began. When did you start experiencing your symptoms? Um, so that is a little bit of a longer story because um, I, I've always had really, really horrific periods and just kind of thought it was normal um, from my first one. Um, but I would say about five years ago was the first time I went to the gynecologist and said, something doesn't feel right. Um, and I had, it was uh, a lot of, a lot of stomach symptoms. I started having some GI issues that I noticed was um, at the same time as my cycle that was kind of following along. And I said, this doesn't feel right. I think something's going on. And I was told I was dehydrated. So it was kind of five years of not feeling right until they got extremely severe uh, August, 2020. Uh, so was it those GI symptoms that caused you to seek your treatment then? Um, they got the severe symptoms that started August 2020 was GI symptoms at all times of the month. Yeah. And then I had, I developed a really severe lower back pain on the lower right side of my body that got more aggressive with um, ovulation as well as during my actual period. And then it was kind of debilitating sugar. I had like low blood sugar that was really spiking at weird times. Um, and then the periods became absolutely debilitating to the point where I couldn't walk. I couldn't stand up straight. Um, and then really just got worse from August, 2020 on. And I finally, Chris was uh, great and said, I think this is time. This is really not normal. So January, 2021, I've sought help for the first time and said this is not a normal thing i need i need more support um so i went to my OBGYN and she found a cyst that was causing a lot of the problems with my back but that was really what what um kicked everything off for me and started the real journey and the search for what was going on and can you tell us which course of treatment you decided to pursue after that diagnosis Yes, so my OBGYN unfortunately is not well versed in endometriosis at all. Um, so I got an MRI. She kind of, after a bunch of ultrasounds, she did an, an MRI and it showed endometriosis on the actual scan. So she sent me to, uh, she said, find a specialist. Ugh, that yeah. was. Uh, a little overwhelming and I was able to find Dr. Kathy Wong who is out of NYU Langone, the endometriosis center. I was lucky enough to have a family friend that just said, nope, we're getting you in. And there really was no um, second guessing with Dr. Wong. She looked at my MRI and said, you need surgery. This, this needs to be removed from you now. So um, I, it, having someone like her who is an absolute expert and the top of her field, I was confident in her telling me that I needed the surgery and all the research that I did on my own with people said, I, I had changed my diet. Chris started cooking for me so that I was on an anti-inflammatory diet, very low everything, no sugar, no carbs, no gluten, no alcohol. I think, I feel like I think those are four, but those were really helpful but I was still flaring. I was still having flares in the middle of a month at any time, eating a banana would send me off. So I knew the severity was enough that I needed to just go with the surgery. So I met with Dr. Wong early May, 2021 and had surgery. We finally got it scheduled for August, 2021. And are you happy with that so far? It has been life-changing. 
Um, I had stage four, well, I have, because it doesn't go away. Uh, I have stage four endometriosis. So that means it was extremely extensive inside of my body in all different places and from my diaphragm to everywhere. Um, she was an absolute rock star. I, I was cutting life short in a lot of places before my diagnosis and I was really, really limited in what I could and couldn't do. And I live life now like, like normal, I would say it's, it was completely 180, absolutely life-changing. It's been amazing. Good to hear. I'm so happy that worked out well for you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, they say that endometriosis is often a 10-year diagnosis. Why do you think it takes so long to diagnose? Everyone's uh, journey with this is different, but everyone I've talked to and all the research I've done kind of unfortunately points to a lack of knowledge in the medical community. Um, I, I absolutely grew up believing everything the doctors said, knowing exactly that they, they are the authority, but my experience with endo has been completely different. I don't think that the medical community has put a priority on this, and it's because it is mostly unknown. They, they don't know what causes it. They don't know what makes it worse. They don't know how to find a cure. They don't really know anything. And it gets misdiagnosed consistently. I was told I was dehydrated. I have friends told that they've had, de that they've had um, IBS. Anything, it gets diagnosed as anything other than endo. It is never the first thing someone looks to find. And also, very unfortunately, it can only be truly diagnosed with surgery. That is also a huge barrier to this. People have no access to experts that can do this. Um, medical coverage is extremely expensive. It is not easy for you to find a doctor willing to say, yes, go get the MRI. Let's see if we can diagnose you from that. The things that would help you diagnose it earlier are more expensive in the medical community. So there's quite a layered, um, barrier. It's not just one thing, it's quite a few that are really causing women to just not know where to go and what to do. Yeah, and I know you touched on this earlier before, but can you talk more about how that delayed diagnosis impacted your health and overall quality of life? Yes, um, like it really brings me back. I, I try, now that my life has been a little better, it's hard for me to go to that place, but um, I, I, I would say it, there was not a part of my life that wasn't affected. I, I thank, I'm so thankful that it really came to a head during the pandemic because I would have absolutely not been able to commute to work. I would not have been able to get myself out of my apartment to go on a subway. I would have passed out and I have passed out. So, um, I had to leave dinners early. If we went to dinner now, looking back at it, I know what it was. I would be at dinner with Chris or with friends and we would have to leave early because I would go into a flare because I ate something and I didn't know. Um, I, I, would, I was taking four to five ibuprofen every four hours during my period. So I'm sure that caused liver damage. I'm sure that wasn't great for the rest of my body. It caused problems with the rest of my um, muscle groups because I was overcompensating to protect my core and protect every like my hips um, and I'm in I'm in pelvic floor physical therapy right now to kind of undo a lot of the damage that I did during the times that I was kind of ignoring it um, but every decision we made what I ate where we went um, it affected Chris a ton because I couldn't go do errands I couldn't run the errands and go to the grocery store because I was on the floor in the grocery store, unable to move. Um, it just really was a whole body thing for me and it it affected not only me, but my friends. I had to leave. I couldn't make social, certain social events because I was afraid something might happen. If it was on my period, it was a no-no. I couldn't do it. So really just every part of my life. Yeah, that definitely carries such a big impact in 
so many ways more than anyone tends to think of when they think of endometriosis mm -hmm. or any other sort of thing along those lines. Um, Chris, can you talk about what you learned as a partner of someone battling with this condition and through all of these symptoms that she Sure. Um, I think to, to put it lightly, um, you know, there was a slew of things I, I learned and in different succession, you know, um, first off was just from a relationship standpoint and a health standpoint was the importance of being an active listener, um, primarily because I think sometimes we spend so much time in our own head um, where we don't maybe keep a, a great mental journal of, okay, here's how I'm feeling or here's the consistency of different, uh, you know, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, symptoms, the, the consistency of different symptoms. So once we kind of realized that this was an ongoing thing, one of the first things that I really learned was important was be an active listener for when Allison's having symptoms or even discomfort or, you know, and then on the flip side, when she's having good days, um, you know, and that kind of active listening really helped to inform the way we went about scheduling our lives uh, from everything from when we were going to go out on errands or when we were going to spend time with friends obviously the caveat being that this was during a pandemic so there wasn't a ton of social gathering to begin with but um uh, the the most important part you know was also uh realizing how kind of keeping a journal of those symptoms should also impact her diet and and how you know um, I can help kind of prepare meals based on symptoms, knowing, okay, tonight we're going to focus on X, Y, and Z, because we know that over the past three or four days, there's been a lot of inflammation and there's been, you know, a lot of discomfort or, um, you know, on the flip side, also not thinking we can, you know, split a pizza tonight because she's had three or four good days in a row. So I think first and foremost, it's been listening, um, you know, and, and just recognizing the, the biggest thing I learned was recognizing that, you know, this, uh, this disease is also not something that you go out alone. It's, it, I would think helps to have a partner there to, to not only help kind of chronicle symptoms and what's going on, obviously to help, you know, go through some of the mental aspects of it. Um, you know, but I learned that you definitely don't go through this alone. Um, I also learned a great deal about the, the female reproductive and health system. I mean, this is something that as a 29 year old guy, uh, without sisters or, you know, I, I was, this was information I was never privy to. And, um, it's something that I think every single not even guy girl regardless everybody should be aware of this everybody should be you know understanding to a certain degree of what this disease entails because there are people probably in your own lives who you can help just by saying oh i, I you you know you may want to consider x y and z um or you may want to you know consider learning more about it or, or something like that so um I've, I would say that the three biggest things I learned, like I said, active listening, the importance of active listening in terms of just day to day, you know, helping her manage however I can, um, you know, learning about the, the disease itself and kind of the ecosystem that the disease takes place in. And then also learning about how woefully um, unprepared and kind of sadly on, un, un, you know, knowledgeable um the community is about this i think the, the not to not to like soapbox a little bit but i think we both realized coming out on the other end of this we learned that it's super important to become an advocate and um you know prior to prior to this entire journey like this is something that it's not exactly the easiest thing to bring up in conversation mm -hmm. especially amongst friends or family because you immediately you're you're talking about you know you're, you're talking about quote unquote traditional women's health issues that are just for some reason shouldn't be discussed um and a huge part of it also you know 
you a natural part of this conversation ends up being, you know, sexual health. It ends up being reproductive health. All of these things are kind of tough to talk about, you know, oh, how was your weekend? Great. Let's like slide right, you know, but um, I think the thing that I learned was it, A, it should be okay to discuss that stuff with your friends, especially if you think that somebody in your life is having these symptoms. Um, so, you know, I came out really being vocal amongst friends of ours who, hey, you're not feeling great. Like, talk to somebody sooner than you think you need to. Um, you know, so so I've I've my eyes have certainly been opened um, in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, but I think the most important thing that I learned was just this has got to come out of the closet as some hush hush thing that we either shouldn't or can't talk about because it's either um, too uncomfortable or we don't know enough about it. I, I think that's kind of on both sides. The medical community might not talk about it as much because they just, you know, your average OBGYN may not know that much about it. That's not an excuse. And other folks don't talk about it because either it's something uncomfortable or, you know, maybe it's not the, the the easiest thing to discuss, that's not an excuse either. Um, so I think it's it's incredibly important to discuss openly. Going along those lines, uh, what advice would you give a partner of a person battling with endometriosis so that they can provide that best support? Um, I mean, a, a, probably two or three pieces. One, on kind of the practical side, um, learn to cook. <laughs> you know, everybody, everybody kind of is, has various levels of comfortability in the kitchen, I would say. Um, I love, I love to cook. I, I've always loved to cook. So this was somewhat of a uh, interesting transition because, you know, we got to experiment with different ingredients. But um, even if you're not comfortable at all cooking and you can just barely boil water, learn, learn to make a couple of really low inflammatory dishes. Um, one of the things that I learned right off the bat was um, it's, it's some of the simplest cooking available. And it's it's great because it's not super time consuming. It's really, really delicious. Um, and I think the, the most important thing, you know, not the most important, but up there is, is definitely learn to cook for, for two main reasons. One, um, food is fuel. So, if you know we found out that diet made a huge difference in how she was feeling um so let's start with the best fuel we can so that that you're already kind of doing a huge favor there uh the other reason why it's super important is because mobility and like just even feeling like doing mm -hmm. stuff at the end of a day has now you know on on any on any perfect day at the end of a long work day, last thing anybody wants to do is cook dinner. That is 20,000 times full when you're flaring up. So even if it's not the most delicious thing in the world, you're at least doing that for your partner and you're taking the burden of, of cooking off of them, um, which is super helpful. So at least I think it's yes. um, I think the second thing uh, that is, you know, the best advice I can give. And admittedly, this was something that I had to work on in the beginning as we both learned more about the disease is patience. Um, because, you know, it, it requires patience in all aspects of your life in terms of, you know, things are going to move at a different pace. Um, there is going to be times when, you know, and the there, there were, or, or also I like, know. you know, we're, we're not going to be able to go out and do that planned thing that we wanted to yeah. do. Um, you know, and I think learning patience and learning, you know, understanding, I think every, you know, it's a human reaction to be bummed or frustrated or that's going to happen. And, you know, Allison was fantastic in realizing you know, bear in mind, this is during a pandemic. So we're already roommates and coworkers and, you know, all of the above. Um, but 
just recognize that you're going to hit patches where you know you're going to have to set stuff aside because there might be flare-ups or your partner may just not be feeling well but the most important thing through all of it is take a step back and recognize what's important you know um and and i would say having having patience is is going to be hugely important and you know also it's okay to have that open communication with your partner and say hey listen i know we're staying home that's the right thing to do i'm a little bummed about it okay cool no problem we're gonna make tonight a special night home you know so um communication is definitely a huge portion of it that is overall great advice <laughs> all of it um i'm sure that's going to be very helpful to a lot of partners especially ones who really want to help but just don't know how to cross over that line I'm sure that's going to be so valuable to our community and also for someone with endometriosis to share with their partner and say these mm -hmm. are the ways that I could use your help because a lot of people don't know how to go from there either that was a huge so. part of us was in the very beginning it was like like we're I don't know if lucky is the right word but we have the benefit of kind of hindsight being 2020 like she's several months out of her surgery we're talking with you quality of life has drastically improved. We're seeing people again, but it, you know, so it, definitely like it was caveating a, it. a, a rose colored glasses yeah. here. Like at the beginning, I think the other thing to keep in mind is, is being okay with the fact that this is a, probably a new thing for a lot of couples to go through. And like, you are going to have, cause before we knew what was going on, um, yeah that was a point of tension a lot yeah. and it was frustration with both of us and it, it you know it's like that I think is a huge reason why it can't you know in in some of the advice that we give to our friends talk to somebody sooner than you think yeah. you need to because even if it ends up not being endometriosis at least you'll get an answer sooner rather than later because what happened with us was that we didn't know for so long and those symptoms and that quality of life yeah. takes a toll on your every day and on your relationship. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was really only once we found out that it was endo and there was an action plan where, yeah. where we were able to be like, okay, we're gonna, you know, here's, here's how we're gonna go about this. Here's how we're gonna, you know, kind of compartmentalize how you're feeling and when you're feeling a certain way, like, that's a tough road on the way there. So if talking to somebody earlier helps you navigate some of that kind of long runway of, you know, friction, um, it's well worth it. So Allison, you've said that others who battled endometriosis have reached out to you after they learned about your struggle. Can you talk a little bit more about what they said and how they've expressed that solidarity? Um, Chris mentioned this when I found out I knew what endo was because my mother had it <clears throat> and hers was a, <coughs> very lucky hers was nowhere near the symptoms that I have but a lot of people have never heard that word so when I started experiencing problems I made it a point to talk about it with my friends because I knew this isn't right like we should be talking about this but once I got diagnosed I was talking about it with everyone. <laughs> Just like, honestly, anything and anyone I could talk to. I was like, this is what's happening to me. You need to know this is a problem. Um, Cause people, you, we had kind of, period talk is not a big thing. It's really not. Um, and I went to an all high school. So like my friends are very, we share a lot, but that was still kind of off topic. So once I knew about this, I had felt so alone. When I was going through this, I have never felt more alone in my life. And until we got the action plan, I was like, this is, I'm, I'm on an island, I don't know what's going on. So I read a lot of books, I read a lot of things, but that still wasn't the same as that like human connection of like, oh, I have a cold. I know what that feels like. I'm, I feel bad for you. Chris did a good job of when I wasn't feeling good, he'd just tell his friends, hey, Allison's endometriosis is flaring, I can't come. So people started to come to us saying, oh, 
my girlfriend's having some issues. Would she mind talking to Allison? Like, would Allison mind talking to her? My friends, people would come to them and be and say, I've been feeling really off lately. I think I might have this. And they would say, I have a friend. Do you want to talk to her? So when I've had these conversations with women, and I, honestly, anyone with endo, we call them friendos because it's, it's not just a woman issue. I try, number one, to get the point across that they need to advocate for themselves because with the lack of knowledge, there's a wonderful endometriosis surgeon in Hoboken, Dr. Vidali, and he's incredible. And his number one advice to his patients is, unfortunately, you know more than your doctor. You need to push for the things that you need. So I first tell them, advocate for yourself, try to get an MRI, try to get something that can diagnose you. Make sure you're seeing a good doctor who knows what they're doing. Try to find a specialist. I'll set you up with Dr. Wong. Um, number two, I try to talk about their symptoms because nothing felt as good for me as seeing someone else have the symptoms. So I didn't think it was in my head to have that validation of, oh my goodness, that's an endo symptom. It's not just me. Things aren't going haywire for no reason. This is part of my disease. I've never felt validation like that. And then the third thing is just listen to them because we are not listened to often. <laughs> it's, it's just kind of, it's so isolating. So having the ability to just listen to them is I think invaluable because that's what it was for me. And what do you think those doctors in the medical community can do better to promote endometriosis awareness and provide a more timely diagnosis? I'm an educator, so I understand how the a lot of these things happen in medical school. I know that their endometriosis is not talked about in medical school. Um, I would love, I would love if anyone walked into an OBGYN and they had a list of other things besides ovarian cancer that can happen to women. That is really the only thing that gets talked about. Um, and yeah, this is extremely important, but there are other things that are causing severe issues in women. This is causing infertility. A lot of women go in for infertility issues and endometriosis is never brought up. And that to me is crazy because that there are so many women now that are retroactively being, being diagnosed because they were never able to conceive and there was never anything wrong because they never went in for a laparoscopy. So OBGYNs, general OBGYNs need to do the work of learning about other women's diseases other than the big ones, which is ovarian cancer and general infertility. Um, and I know that's a tall order because they're extremely busy and they have a ton of things and then they are, they're OBs, not just GYN. So there's a lot of stuff that they need to do their research on, but they, this is now affecting one in 10 women, which is a very large number. So find the specialists, learn from them. Endo found is an incredible foundation just dedicated to this, pumping out resources at all times, professional developments for doctors. It has to be on people's radars. That's great advice. And before we wrap things up, I wanted to open up the floor and ask if there is anything else either of you would like to add to share with the community. Um, it, as I said, it can be the most scary, isolating thing to know that something is wrong with you and you don't know what it is. Um, track your symptoms track 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 if if i hadn't been keeping track of it i wouldn't have noticed my patterns that was one of the biggest things that caused my OBGYN to to uh, call for the mri um know your endo is an amazing book um by jessica bernani she is the, my guru i'm really can't can't say enough about that community she's created um there is help out there you, you have to research and do it on your own, which is really, really terrible, but it is, it is now our reality, but there absolutely is 
a light at the end of the tunnel. It did not feel like it for me one year ago at all, but it's a lifelong struggle and we have to advocate for ourselves. But when we work hard to talk about this, um, that's what's gonna make it easier for other women and other folks with endo. That is kind of all I'm hoping for. And honestly, at this point, it can come back for me, but having the resources that I have, having the support that I have with Chris, having the support that I have with the endo community is what's going to make the lifelong difference for me. Yeah, I the the one piece that I would just say as a partner and kind of advocate now, um, I think based on the small size of the community, um, this it's very much a kind of quality over quantity. So there may not be a ton of folks, but this is one place where I've found through you know. This is one of the seemingly few things that the power of the internet yes. is hugely helpful for um, because, you know, I found the most kind of esoteric discussion groups or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, the communities of people who are sharing everything from like coping mechanisms to helpful products, to recipes, yes. to, you know, uh, everything everything under the sun you can imagine because it's not that broad of a community yeah. um it is still a super passionate one because you know i think anybody either goes through it the first time or goes through it multiple times or you know it, again to allison's point like it's seemingly a lifelong journey um there are a lot of advocates out there so you know while the medical community may not be quite there yet we have found and not certainly not to say anything like snake oil sales me but um we like kind of sourced a lot of small community health tips yeah. that ended up being hugely impactful not having to do with substances or vitamins or anything just diet related or you know mm -hmm. just mental health related like here are some ways that you know stretches you can yeah meditation all, all these yeah. different things that i found just through searching online yeah um you know so don't be afraid to to look for it and you know uh, just take <laughs> take take pleasure in the fact at at the very least knowing that there are a lot of people out there it may not seem like it but there's a lot of people out there who either are going or have gone through some of the same things that you have as a couple and there is help. It's just coming from a untraditional, non-traditional source. I would also say, you know your body the best. No one knows it like you do. So if you are told you're being dramatic or you are dehydrated or something else, keep going. You know your body, you know when something is off. and you're almost 100% going to be right. Thank you so much, you guys, for opening up, sharing your story, giving all of this wonderful advice. We're so grateful for you guys to share this with our community. Thank you, Bridget. It was wonderful for to, sure. to talk about it. We're happy to share. Thank you so much.